Could Israel and Sudan soon become friends? Israel announces plans for the normalization of ties, catching Sudan's transitional government off guard. And the once hostile nations, are they moving closer together? And what can be achieved? This is Inside Story. Hello there, welcome to the programme. I'm Nick Clark. So, Sudan and Israel have historically had frosty relations. They have no formal ties, and Sudan is one of the strongest supporters of a Palestinian state. But on Monday, Israel's Prime Minister, Benjamin Netanyahu, he met with the Sudanese general, Abdul Fattah al burhan in Uganda on the agenda, the normalisation of ties between the two countries. The following day, Burhan defended the talks and also reiterated Sudan's commitment to the Palestinian cause. The issue is dividing opinion in the capital, Khartoum. We're sending this message to the head of the Sovereign Council, Abdel Fattah al burhan What a shame it is for a Sudanese to sit at the same table as Benjamin Netanyahu. We are with the Muslim and Arab worlds, and the Muslim and Arab worlds both have ties with Israel. So I believe there's no harm in establishing relations with Israel that will be built on mutual interests and the guaranteed rights of the Palestinian people to establish a Palestinian state. Well, al Burhan heads Sudan's Sovereign Council, which is part of a power-sharing deal between the military and civilian parties. And while the Prime Minister, Abdullah Hamdok, welcomed al Burhan's statement about his meeting with Netanyahu, he stressed that under the draft constitution, decisions on foreign affairs must be made by the cabinet to ensure that they are transparent and accountable. All right, let's bring in our guests straight away. Right here in the studio, we have Walid uh, Madibu, who is the president of the Sudan Policy Forum and an expert on governance and international development. Uh, from Khartoum in Sudan via Skype, uh, Hajuj Kuka, who's a filmmaker and activist. And in West Jerusalem, we have Alon Lil, a former director general of the Foreign Ministry of Israel. Welcome all to the program. Uh, Walid, I'd like to start here in the studio. Well, what's going on here? Are both elements of the power sharing uh, government on the same page about this? I, I believe that uh, the, the military council or the military officers in the sovereign council has completely succeeded in co-opting the civilian component. Uh, I, I have no doubt that the civilians already know about this. So it, they weren't surprised by it as, uh, they, as they made out? Absolutely not. It's just uh, hmm. they're just playing a small uh, gimmick on the masses here. But uh, I totally believe that they... they, they they, they are in full support of uh, Burhan, uh, yet uh, we question the extent to which uh, Burhan's uh, statement could have any institutional support, institutional or popular support. Remember, there are some nuances here, given the Sudan historical uh, record. It's not now the difference between civilians and military officers. The difference is between centrist, riverian, elites who in the past 64 years have succeeded in manipulating the process of nation building in the center. You, you mean the elites who lived along the River Nile? Uh, in the center and the yeah. River Nile. Yeah. And these are, these are the ones who used uh, ideology to manipulate the politics, mainly Ba'athist, uh, Arab nationalist, uh, Islamist, and uh, I would say Nasserist. So at the expense of, uh, you know, alienating the periphery, uh, South Kurdufan, Darfur, even Southern Sudan before it seceded, uh, they, they, they have uh, aligned themselves with the Arab, uh, Arab world. And uh, uh, now they, they, don't, they don't feel that they have any support, neither along uh, the military. Uh, they don't have any resources. They used to, uh, I mean, the, they used their monopoly over the military to uh, I mean, to uh, subside the, the periphery. And now they feel they have no alternative but to move from extremism to opportunism. OK, okay but when you say that the, the power sharing government does not have any institutional support, they are the institution, aren't they, uh, for this plan? Uh, they don't have uh, an institutional support for this kind of a move. Uh, I, I think this kind of a, a move is very blunt and I don't think that the forces of freedom and change 
uh, are going to, I mean, sell it easily to the to the popular uh, masses. Okay, well, it's, uh, it's a good point at which to bring in Hajuj Kuka there in Khartoum. You were protesting long before the protest started, really. Uh, what's your assessment of this from, from the, the popular point of view? Yeah, exactly what Medipo was saying. Um, the Sudanese people are anonymously with the rights of the occupied people of Palestine to have their own independent state with a capital in Jerusalem. This has been how most of the people in the streets see it. Uh, it's, it's something that's not debatable in Sudan. And to change that, you need to have a long debate that starts on the ground. So to actually come and see uh, Burhan go and go all over that and do something completely different uh, is a big, a big no. Uh, and on two, on two levels, one that this is something that we're all, especially after a revolution, especially after going through oppression and freedom, we feel like we're more connected to other rights and people who are fighting for the rights in other places in the world. So regardless of the Arab Muslim um, conversation, this is a people's conversation and we're definitely in the street. People are all about fighting for rights and whatnot. Uh, so definitely people are standing against what Burhan said. So that's on what? one side. The other side is Burhan himself. Yeah, and then the other, the other thing is the idea that Burhan comes back and does things what they used to do during the time of dictatorship, where he thinks he can use parental, I know better than I'm an elitist, I know better what the country needs, and I'm going to do what's right. And using the same military dictatorship um, mentality that they've been ruling the country for 30 years, and... And this switch just doesn't work for the people. So now this this gave a momentum for people to rise and be angry against it. And the freedom for change also, like uh, Medibu said, cannot stand and make the people change their minds at this point. And the same thing for freedom and change and for the prime minister uh, and his cabinet. So definitely there is a unanimous uh, stand against this mentality, this parental mentality that comes from the center, like many said. And if the leadership pursues with this policy, what will happen then? I mean, people are already like talking about going out in the street and protesting. Um, right now, I actually really doubt it because they really need the people's support. The community of resistance in Sudan has been really strong. Uh, they've been um, going out in the street. They've been uh, in the government itself. There's a lot of people who are really connected to the street. So at this point, uh, if something like this happens, it will actually bring about a lot of response in this street, like protests and whatnot, for sure. All right, let's bring in the Israeli uh, perspective. Alon Neil, from, from the Israeli point of view, certainly in, in Netanyahu's interests uh, for people to believe that the Arab world is, is leaning towards Israel. Yes, here we have uh, two things happening simultaneously. We have elections. Uh, we are in, inside the election month already. Uh, Netanyahu uh, wants to impress the public and strengthen his image as a diplomatic magician. And definitely such a visit to a big Muslim country, very close to Israel, neighboring Egypt, uh, made an impact. Uh, all kind of denials and hesitations later hardly reached the ear and the eye of the Israeli uh, citizens, so uh, it left an impact. It was very important to Netanyahu. The other thing happening is uh, the Trump plan. Uh, Netanyahu badly, badly needs uh, the votes of the Arab countries next week already in the Security Council in the vote on the Trump plan. There are two uh, African countries on the council now, South Africa and Niger, Netanyahu hopes that through the strengthening of the contacts with Africa in general, the African Union will instruct its representative in the Security Council not to vote against the plan. These are the things that are important to Netanyahu at the moment. Bilaterally, we can help Sudan a lot, but I don't think Sudan can help us a lot, except the issue of flights about, above Sudan. So uh, the interest here is mostly in the international and regional implications. Right. And what is your sense? Is your sense that the African Union will go uh, down that route? 
Um, first of all, we'll know uh, very soon the vote is on Tuesday. Uh, my sense is that Netanyahu will not get the votes of the African countries. <coughs> the, the reason is that uh, the reaction of the Islamic world, the, the Arab League, uh, Europe, Russia was negative to the American plan. And I don't see Africa standing with Netanyahu while the whole world is against or even uh, negative to the plan. All right. Well, it certainly would be a big turnaround if it happened. Israel officially has diplomatic relations with, at the moment, only two Arab countries. Egypt signed a peace treaty uh, with Israel back in 1979. And 15 years later, Jordan established diplomatic ties. Uh, that muddied the Arab consensus on what's known as the three no's to Israel after the 1967 Arab-Israeli war. That's no to peace, no to recognition, and no to negotiations. Well, in 2002, a Saudi-brokered Arab peace initiative offered to normalize ties with Israel in exchange for a plan to solve the conflict with the Palestinians. Now, Saudi Arabia, the UAE, that's the United Arab Emirates, and Bahrain, they're reportedly quietly cozying up to Israel. And the Israeli Prime Minister, Benjamin Netanyahu, uh, he made a surprise visit to Oman back in 2018. If Sudan does normalize ties with Israel, it would have huge implications for Africa, as we've been discussing as well. Uh, many African nations vote in favor of pro-Palestinian resolutions at the UN. Uh, Walid Madibo, do you think it's possible we might see a slow lean towards Israel by Arab states? Is it likely to happen that the, the three no's, as we talked about there, are consigned to history? Uh, I'm not an expert per se in uh, Arab-Israeli conflict, but I, I, I think uh, uh, with America not having a, a very clear strategy for the MENA region, the Middle East, North Africa, it's very likely to be uh, uh, persuaded, to be uh, taken on board by uh, Israeli politicians. And I, I don't think that th that's going to help the Arabs come to some sort of uh, a unanimous, uh, uh, needless to say, uh, reach some level of uniformity about a strategy that can be developed by the Arabs and the Africans towards Israel. But since we're talking about Sudan here, I, I think it's very, it's very ironic that the so-called o oasis of democracy, the Israeli state, only chooses to deal with dictators, authoritarian leaders, and at this specific moment, it's dealing with genociders. Remember, Israel mobilized its lobby in, in America, and it helped put together a platform called uh, Save Darfur, and it was, uh, it was helping very much, helping very much the, the cause of uh, uh, Darfurians. It even gave... Uh, uh, re refuge to some uh, civilians who came to Israel, and now it's dealing with uh, the very the very personality that is uh, accused of having committed uh, genocide in, in Darfur. So it's very shameful for uh, Netanyahu. It's uh, it's very shameful even for uh, uh, the the president uh, Burhan uh, to to follow an unconstitutional move and try to push this case in, in an unstrategic manner. Sudan needs to come to peace with itself and its neighbors. It needs to do justice to the people of the periphery. It needs to uh, adopt some democratic proceedings that will make any move in the, in the future sustainable. Uh, whichever move Sudan makes, it has to, to, to gain some sustainability, it has to follow some uh, some uh, very clear path. Uh, now, if you look at Sudan, for so long, uh, it was just uh, a proxy state. Now it has developed into being a fully-fledged proxy state. Uh, prior to uh, this regime, it was moved by some Arab states in some Islamic extremist uh, direction. And now it's being moved into some very opportunist direction. Neither of these is helpful to Sudan. Right. Uh, if we can bring in Hajuj again, uh, it's true to say that uh, normalizing relations with Israel would open the door to greater possibilities for Sudan uh, to move away from sanctions and this, this feeling of Sudan being a pariah state. But is, is that something that you say that the people of Sudan would never accept? Yeah, no, no, no. There's, there's no way Sudanese people will accept that. Actually, Sudanese people are really angry 
one of the things we're really angry about the prime minister and the government in general is instead of trying to find ways where the people of Sudan, the Sudanese people, can actually be on the forefront of trying to solve our economic problems and all our other issues within the country, he is actually looking outwards. He's looking towards the States, to Europe, uh, to the Gulf. He's still been traveling and trying to get money from outside as if the only way to solve our issues is to get foreign money. And the moment that's your main agenda, that's when we start having to deal with other people's agendas. And that's when we have to deal with stuff like this. So there is, there is this thing of, no, we should not compromise. We should, in the beginning, try to figure out things ourselves before we ask ourselves, outsiders for help. And there is a belief within the Sudanese uh, people, especially after the revolution and how we saw everybody come together, that we can do it. We actually can solve the basic problems of Sudan. Uh, start the infrastructure, start the groundwork that needs to be done by us and owned by us. And we don't want that to be owned by outsiders. And that's, that's the disconnect that's happening right now where the government is just really, really trying to connect more to the IMF, to the World Bank, to outsiders, to, to, and, and to solve our economic issues. And I think this is a disconnect. So to think that you can give up um, basic ideas uh, like people, like fighting for other people's rights and standing with what's right in the world with the truth is not uh it's not going to happen in sudan right now and i feel like to actually make us change our minds you have to tell us why why explain to us why this is better for the palestinian people and how they as a people are going to get their full human rights uh, so i think this is the only way it's going to happen right i don't there's like... one more thing i want to say go ahead that uh uh, Sudan has always been called the heart of Africa, and Sudan stands in a way where it's connected to both the Arab world and the African world. So if Sudan ever stops be being a proxy, like Madibu said, if it stops playing other people's agendas, and they can, we can actually control our own country and have uh, a government, a movement that goes forward where we're thinking about Sudan as an independent state and where we can stand in the world, what we can offer, Sudan will play a very important role in, in issues that pertain to the connections between Africa and the Arab world. And I think this is a natural state for Sudan. But, but right now, they've just been controlled too much by outsiders and due to the idea of being just a proxy country and proxy government. Okay, I can, see, I can see both our, both our guests here. Government. Both our other guests here, had you uh, want to come in on this. Uh, Walid, if I can start with you in the studio. Yes, uh, remember, I mean, uh, if you look at Sudan, uh, there, uh, there are uh, uh, two American uh, ambassadors that were killed in Sudan. Uh, there are uh, many European uh, tourists that were uh, assassinated in uh, Sudan. Uh, the arms uh, were, I mean, uh, of course, the uh, Israeli security has failed the attempt of some uh, extremist groups to pass the, uh, some uh, military, uh, some weapons to uh, to some jihadist yeah. groups. So, uh, I, I mean, going back to what Hajush is saying, he's absolutely right in the sense that if we can just come to peace within ourselves, we will be helpful both to the Palestinians and to the Israelis. If we can just control our borders, we don't want our land, this antique land, to be uh, used by some secular and religious psychophants. Uh, to, to play whichever, and to pass whichever right. agenda they want to. So uh, let us just come to peace uh, within ourselves yeah. and we'll be, we will be helpful to humanity at large. Uh, but uh, the way things are heading, I think okay. this... Let me please... Uh, no, go ahead, yes, uh, come in, please. Uh, uh, please, please, let me come back to your original question about Israel and the Middle East, or if you want, Israel and Africa. Because the founders of Israel uh, aimed at integration of Israel in the Middle East, political, social, cultural integration. And the idea of peace was that peace between Israel and the Arabs and Israel and the Palestinians will enable Israeli integration with the surrounding, with, with the Middle Eastern countries. This has been dropped about 15 years ago. Uh, the idea of peace is not around anymore. Nobody in Israel, among the politicians, the Jewish politicians, is speaking about peace with the Palestinians today. So the basic assumption is that 
since we will not have peace with the Palestinians, the Muslim world, the Arab world, will never really accept us politically. So the, the change is we are aiming at economic, technological, maybe some intelligence relations and, and uh, supply the Arab countries, African countries, Muslim African countries, with the basic economic needs in order to improve relations bilaterally. But this does not mean that Israel is aiming to be part of the Middle East. We just forgot about it. We behave as the European countries. The leadership of Israel today sees Israel as a Western country, part of Europe, if you want, part of the United States, but definitely not part of the Middle East. This has to be explained. Even with Egypt and Jordan, that we have really stable peace. It's based on security and some economic technological issues, not on, on political uh, support. The public doesn't like us, not in Egypt, not in Jordan, and, and definitely not cultural relations, no tourism. Uh, so, so there is a different approach in Israel. We are rich. If you want Sudan, if you want any other poor country on the globe. We can give you what you need okay. and you normalize relations with us economically and because more we cannot get. It's, okay, yeah, very, uh, very briefly because uh, I want to yeah, bring you yeah, yeah. Uh, Along the lines of what Mr. Lil is saying, I, I think w whatever is happening now is just going to exacerbate internal politics in Sudan in, in a very negative way because right. it's very obvious that the forces of freedom and change, this thing has only exposed the forces of freedom and change and it tells you the extent to which they are very docile, uh, they, they don't have any sense of direction, they don't have any vision and they don't have any moral or they don't stand on any moral or intellectual grounds. It's, it's not harming Burhan as much, by the way, because Burhan's period is only is supposed to be three years. And, and whatever attempt uh, he makes to uh, prolong this, he has to go uh, through some po uh, pop popular support, and it's not going to happen. Right. Hajuj, uh, the bottom line is, can Sudan find a way forward, find a way to peace and, and prosperity and, and being welcomed back into the world without outside interference? Without what? Outside interference. Interference from other nations. Uh, um, no, I mean, in the end, you, you are going to need, uh, in the world we live today, you are going to need an outside help, but it ha has to be on our terms. So the idea is, one, it has to be on our own terms, and two, it has to start with the neighbors and slowly move up to the, to the world. And I feel like we can we can do that if, if we start to look inwards and then go outwards. It's just the style of what you do. And then when you ask, you don't, you don't take everything that's given to you. You only take things that actually go along your own agenda. And so you're not playing other people's agendas. Um, so to me, that's very important. And to me, that's why with, with, this, with this issue of the Palestinian issue, I feel like the way um, it was explained really well uh, uh, by your other guests, uh, I feel like once the Palestinians feel that they got their rights, uh, the Sudanese can move in and be like, okay, now we can talk to the Israelis. But if we cannot talk to the Israelis before they solve their issues with the Palestinians and before the Palestinians get their rights and then move forward. One final word from you, sir. What we've become very secularized in the sense that it's no longer an emotional uh, battle. We want to move beyond rhetorically oriented reform into policy oriented reform. And, and uh, people are handling this issue of Arab-Israeli conflict in, in a non-rhetorical manner. What, what is it that can help us stabilize the region? Pri previously, it was more religiously or even secularly in the Ba'athist and the Arab nationalists, it was more rhetorical. Now we are looking at things the way Hajush and Mr. Lil are doing it. I mean, uh, we're just wait we have a weighted scale by which we, we are looking at things and we want to help move things in a positive direction. All right, we'll have to leave it there. Uh, Walid Madiba, thanks very much, and Alon Lil. Uh, joining us there from Jerusalem and Hajuj Kuka, we appreciate it very much. Thank you very much indeed.
Uh, thank you too for watching. You can see the program again anytime by visiting our website, aljazeera.com. And for further discussion, just go to our Facebook page. That's facebook.com forward slash AJ Inside Story. And you can also join the conversation on Twitter. Our handle is at AJ Inside Story. From me, Nick Clark, and the whole team here, it's goodbye for now. <laughs>